Hi, this is Rich Wilkerson, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. This is a series entitled, You Know What I Do? You know, at this point in my life, I have so many people say, Pastor, what should I do? So we decided to do a series on it. And there's a part of Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where Paul says, this one thing I do. So we thought we would drill down on those two verses. And uh, the first session is on forget the past. The second session is get a vision of where you're going. The third session is going to be pressing through and just getting there. And the last session will be on I win. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope you know the heart that is coming from it. It's not really a about my wisdom. It's just about the wisdom of the Word of God. And I believe it's going to be a blessing. Welcome to You Know What I Do. Video testimony we've prepared for you today. I want you to open your hearts to receive a message from one of our oldest Trinity Church members, Albert uh, Paldari, and I tell you, it is going to touch your heart. God brought him back from the dead. Watch this video. Hi, my name is Albert Paldari. I've been a part of Trinity Church since the mid-late 80s. I first met Pastor Rich and his lovely wife, Robin, and their family when they arrived in 1998. In fact, I was the cook at the very first barbecue that we had at Olieta State Park for them when they became our pastors. I was also in a gap group with his father, Pastor John, Greg Hardcastle. I love Pastor John. He was like the father, the uncle that I never had. He was so precious to me. Something happened to me recently that I would like to testify and thank the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for. On June 24th, a Sunday afternoon, I ended up at Mount Sinai Hospital. Upon being admitted, within seconds I passed out and didn't wake up for seven full days. I had a major, major cardiovascular event. While there, I had a second cardiovascular event where I actually died twice. I had no heartbeat. Twice I was declared dead. I had no heart function for 10 minutes, which is an aberration and a rarity in a medical field. But I thank God, my Lord and Savior, because He saved me. I survived, and I know it's a complete miracle. My lease in life has been extended. No expiration for now. So I forge on. I know there are bright things ahead in this life, new things to look forward to and to be a part of. God brought me back to life, literally. If the doctor said, I can't even go back to doing the cardio I love, which is surfing, well then, I'm looking forward to a new beginning and a new future. I'm looking to press on. My best days are before me. My best is yet to come. By the way, I went surfing last week, a week ago yesterday. my lord doc says you'll never do that again really albert said really well praise the lord he's going for some cardio uh that's our god and what our god can do today there are some notes on your chair i'd like you to follow along with me and we're going to look at our theme verse for this series of messages you know what i do uh, here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I love that passage. And today, our second in a four-part message series is entitled, You Know What I Do? And the title is, The Strain for Vision. As a pastor, it is 
incumbent upon me that I seek the Lord to find vision for this house. The board wasn't brought on to do that. The associate pastors weren't brought on to do that. None of you came to the church to do that. God has called me, the pastor of this church, to discover the vision he has for this church, not only in the coming days, but in the future. And today I want to talk about the strain for vision. Paul said, stretching toward that which is ahead, stretching toward that which is in front of me. He was straining for vision. Once I have vision, everything else is a piece of cake. Once I know where I'm going, everything else is a piece of cake. I'm serious about that. Oh, I know once I'm headed on the road, road towards the vision, I'm going to get hit. I know I'm going to stumble. I know trouble's going to come, but I've got my vision in sight. I know where I'm going. Uh, years ago, when Rob and I left the field of youth pastoring, uh, which was quite a few years ago, uh, when we were younger, we're young, I'm just saying we were younger then, um, I was 27 years of age and felt God call me to become an evangelist. That meant that I was going to travel and leave the place I had been to go on the road. And this was the month of November 1979. We resigned from our position. We had a couple meetings in Texas that had been planned for a year. We went to Texas. I was with my father. I stayed at dad and mom's house for a couple weeks. And I said, Dad, I need your help. I'm going to be an evangelist. He said, you told me that, son. I'm so happy. I said, I have nothing booked except one thing the first weekend in January, 1980. He said, I'll take it from there. I'll get, I'll get January booked for you. My dad knew hundreds and thousands of leaders across this country. My father booked 30 one-nighters in a row in the state of Minnesota. That year in January, it was between 35 and 50 below zero for the full 30 days that we were there. We didn't start January 1st. We started January 2nd and went to January 31st. We stayed in a church for 30 days. A friend let me use a car for free for 30 days, and we drove all over the state of Minnesota doing one-nighters. We got on the plane to come home, and we had made as much money on those 30 one-nighters as we had being youth pastors the month before. We said, oh, well, thank God. God is going to somehow see us through. But you know what? I only had one meeting booked while I was in Minnesota. Uh, a pastor in Northern California said, I'll have you come and speak Sunday through Wednesday for us. You can start on Sunday morning. Now, folks, I was 27. Senior pastors did not let you start on a Sunday morning back then. It was just impossible. And I said, thank you, Pastor Long. He pastored in Yuba City, California, one hour north of Sacramento, where we had lived for five years. And that's how I knew him. When I got to uh, Yuba City the first week of March, I still didn't know what I was going to do in evangelism. We'd had several meetings in February and kind of struggled along the way and stayed at Robin's mom and dad's house. We lived there for almost a year. And when I didn't have meetings, they fed us, thank God. We didn't go hungry. But that meeting, something happened. Sunday morning, I preached, and when it was over, a principal of the local high school, wasn't a big city, about twenty-five or 30,000 people, he came to the front and he said, Mr. Wilkerson, I need your help. A ninth grade student in my school on Friday night, night shot herself with her brother's handgun, and she died, and she left a suicide note next to her body and yesterday her mother when I visited the mom and dad her mother handed me this note to keep he said I will give you this note if you'll promise a favor for me I said what is the favor he said tomorrow's going to be a terrible day at our school and I don't know what to do would you be willing to come and speak to my entire student body the entire school will put them in the gymnasium he said, if you'll do that, I'll give you this note to keep. I want you to know, church, the next day I spoke at that high school, 
And it was a terrible speech. I can't tell you how bad I did. I wasn't allowed to say Jesus or God for the entire 30 minutes or give my testimony. So I talked about all kinds of, you know, I did, and, but I had that, that note in my hand. And because the students were so sorry, they didn't curse me and they didn't scream at me and they didn't run out. They were just quiet because they were so shocked that this girl had killed herself. And when I read that note to those students, people began to weep in that auditorium. And the principal had given me authority. I said, by the way, tonight, tomorrow night, and Wednesday night, I'll be at this church, Calvary, at 730 to talk to all of you about things concerning eternity and the life hereafter, if you're interested. That night, that church was packed with young people. The next time, night, there was more young people. And by Wednesday night, you couldn't get the people in the building. The lobbies were jammed. And that one night alone, not including the other three nights, that one night, we had 148 students from that high school walk the aisle and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That could have been the end of my life because I felt that was the greatest night and week of my life but what was powerful about that week was I saw the vision I had been straining for vision for four months I didn't know where I was to be going as an evangelist but that week the principal called his friend two hours away and said you need this guy next week in your school the principal called me and said would you come I said I'd be glad to come I called a pastor friend that I had in that city and I said that principal wants me this week can I do a four-night meeting for you? He said, come, Rich, next week, Sunday through Wednesday. And folks, that's how it started. And for the next 17 years, I did Sunday through Wednesday meetings all over the world. And for the next 10 years, I spoke in 1,700 public high schools across the United States and Canada to about 1.6 million students. We saw during that 10-year period a quarter of a million people people accept Jesus Christ as their personal savior in our in evening meetings. Some of you've heard Pastor Alan Griffin. He now does those kind of meetings all over the country. Some of you have heard Reggie Dabbs. He does those kinds of meetings all over the country. It has impacted millions of young people. Why? Because I strained for a vision. And God gave me a vision. And when he gave me the vision, here we go. Let's make it happen. Now some of you today will say, Pastor Rich, how do you get the vision? Because some of you are struggling. You don't know what to do next. Oh, you've got a job, but the job to you has become meaningless, boring. There's nothing to it. Oh, you feed your family. Oh, you've got a roof over your head. You've got clothes on your back, but you keep thinking, I've got this one life. Is this what it is? Is this all there is? Let me tell you something. God wants to attach vision to your job. And once you have a vision for your life, boom, everything else is a piece of cake. I'm telling you, when you have the vision... Here's what Habakkuk said. He said, who? That's right, Habakkuk. Go to Matthew in the New Testament and then go back four books, five books, about six books. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew. So go to Matthew, back up five books. There's Habakkuk. A little known prophet, but what he said was powerful. And he was struggling to find vision. He was straining for a vision. And here's what happened in Habakkuk chapter 2. He writes it, verse 1, look at it with me. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me, God say to me. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. Now folks, this is going to be one of the most simple messages you've ever heard in your life. 
your challenge is in these two verses because in these two verses is the answer to your straining for vision number one how do you receive a vision the bible teaches us to get alone with god if you're struggling for direction get away from the noise get away from all the voices you know what you should do you know what you should do you know what you should do and get alone with god get into a closet get somewhere that's separated and here's what habakkuk said he said i will go to the ramparts and hide myself away in order to hear what he will say to me what is a rampart you know cities in that day and time not today in that day in which this was written were protected by huge walls all around the city these were wide wide walls uh, maybe as wide as this stage and at the top of the wall was what was known as a rampart the rampart the king or the watchmen or the soldiers that were holding 24-hour guard in shifts at that time could walk on top of these ramparts on the ramparts there was another wall to about here with these other spacings of large taller ramparts and the watchman could stand behind the tall rampart and then look through to see perhaps enemies coming look at a rampart i've brought a picture for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Do you see those separated walls at the top? Behind that is the rampart. They're walking on top of the top of the wall and they come between those spaces and they would check out to see. And if arrows were being shot, they would stand right back behind that tall wall. And, and for Habakkuk, the prophet, the rampart was his secret place, was his solitary place. Because he was the prophet over Israel and Judah. He had access to the ramparts. I'm going to get alone with God. I'm going to go to a place that is separate and alone with God. And friends, if you want to hear from God, get alone with Jesus. Stand with Jesus. The Bible says in Psalms 91 and verse 1, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High God, will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, another version says the secret place of the Most High. When you get alone with God in the secret place, Psalms 32 and verse 7, David writes, You, Jesus, are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. What are the songs of deliverance, church? I'll tell you what it is. It's the straining of the of vision and finding the vision. The songs of deliverance are finding the vision, seeing the vision. And once you have the vision, you're delivered. You're going to have deliverance in that moment because you're going to know which direction to take. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 6, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Get alone with the Lord. Get away from the crowd. Come away with Jesus. Get in a solitary place so you can hear what the vision is. Secondly, Habakkuk says, write down what God says to you and make a permanent record of it. Write down what God says to you and make a permanent record of it. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever awakened in the middle of the night and you felt like God was speaking to you? And there was something you never, never thought of before or you'd been thinking of it and there was the answer to what you'd been thinking and you fell back asleep and you woke up the next day and you knew that you'd have been awakened and you couldn't remember what it said? Man, that happened to me a lot. You wake up in the middle of the night and, and God just starts talking. And you're right there because the Bible says in Job, God's talking 24-7. But we're just not listening. And you hear something, and you know, you say, I'll, I'll, I'll write that down in the morning. You go to sleep. In the morning, you wake up, you forgot to write it down. You forgot what he said. 
I have a friend, Dr. Dick Eastman, and Dr. Eastman is married to my first cousin. He is 73 years of age. And in about a month, I'm going to preach in Colorado Springs at his 30th anniversary. He is the president of World Literature Crusade, Every Home Crusade for Christ in Colorado Springs, but it is a worldwide ministry. They have 400 chief supporters of this ministry that have taken them around the world and I will speak to those people on the 30th of his anniversary. This organization was formed in 1952 by Dr. Jack McAllister, a Canadian. Dr. Robin knew him as a little girl. He was a friend of her father as she was growing up. Dr. McAllister is now with Jesus. But many years ago, Dick Eastman, Rob and I spent the night with him, and he told me a story. He says, Rich, he goes, I travel every week with Dr. McAllister. And he said, uh, we only stay in one hotel room. We stay in two double beds. And he said, I, I, I fall asleep, and then I'll hear him stirring in the next bed next to me. And I know what he's doing. He goes to sleep with a, a pad of yellow Post-it notes. You know what I'm talking about. And there's a pencil next to those yellow Post-it notes. And in the middle of the night, he wakes up and God speaks to him. And he picks that, those Post-it notes up in the middle of the night with that pencil and starts writing down what God's saying. Rips it off, throws it on the floor. Writes, keeps writing, rips it off, throws it on the floor. And he said, he'll, through the night, he'll wake up, write something down, throw it on the floor. He goes, I wake up every morning when I'm on the road with him and there are about 20 yellow Post-it notes on the floor between our beds and Dr. McAllister will pick those notes up and then singularly write out a long legal side page of paper and write each one of these notes down and clarify them. He now has hundreds and thousands of yellow legal pads what happened through the month of July in 1956 because of what God's been speaking to him in the night. Now folks you say why that is that important? Because long after Doc McAllister passed away they kept going with the same vision and improved on it based upon what he had written down what God said to him through the years in 2010 I don't have better more modern uh, information but except from 2010 as of 2010 World Literature Crusades has 70,000 missionaries a month Every month around the world, going door to door, giving people literature in little village huts, in little obscure apartment buildings, door to door, in high rise tenant houses, in third world countries. They have distributed since 1952 2.3 billion gospel tracts to 1.3 billion homes and when the people get the gospel tracts many of them come to faith in Jesus Christ how does the mission keep going someone wrote it down 65 years ago and kept writing the vision down and that's how God has worked in 1776, 56 men came together to write the Declaration of Independence for the United States. Not long after that, they wrote the U.S. Constitution. There were only 13 colonies at that time. Today, there are 50 states, 330 million people, the most powerful nation on the globe today. How did it happen? Those two articles have guided us for these 242 years. Write it down. Here's what John said. John 20 and verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What are these? These are written. What are these? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Folks, how else do we come to faith in Christ? But because of that written record, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Someone won you to Christ at school or in the neighborhood or at your place of employment. But eventually, you accepted Christ and got to a Bible. And you started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those were written so that we might have life and life 
more abundantly. And here's what the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 10. This is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not tearing you down. What was he talking about? He was talking about half of the New Testament that he had written to explain to us how the church of Jesus Christ is to operate, how we are going to go about daily business, how we get the gospel out from this place called the house of God. How did it all happen? Years ago, someone wrote the record down for a permanent record. Can you say amen? Pastor Rob and I are working on written records. I write a daily devotional for five years now. We wrote together four years ago, Inside Out. It's the story of Trinity Church's DNA and how we roll as a congregation. The book has sold thousands of copies. We've given thousands more away to people all over the world. She wrote a book last year called Breaking the Stained Glass Ceiling, a coaching guide for women in ministry. Here we are, a church leading the way nationally and internationally for women that are going into full-time gospel service. And thousands have purchased her book and have been given the book as well. I'm writing a new book. In fact, I finished it. It's at the publisher. It will be out in six months. It's called I choose honor. And the entire book is about honor is our calling and how we as a church are winning because we're honorable people. Uh, I'm writing my dissertation for my doctorate right now. It's called Lifters and Gifters. How a great church stays together. And this is a doctoral dissertation. It will turn into a book that will go to pastors all over the world as a printed record. And then I have another book that must be done in the next nine months. And it's called The Art of Big G Leadership. The main title is Father First. Do you remember last year at the same time we did a series, 10 weeks, it was called Understudies. Remember that series? People heard about it. They contacted us from Charisma House Publishers in Orlando, Florida and said, we want that series to turn into a book. And so we will start that book in the next several weeks. I'm telling you, it is a printed record. Write it. What's the vision? Write it down and last of all make sure Habakkuk said that you make the vision clear so it can be reproduced sometime you get a vision you share your vision and people go what? huh and it gets confusing he said Make it clear. Here's what he says. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 2. God said to him, make it so clear that a herald could run the vision a year away, six months away, a mile away, 30 minutes away. Make, make it so clear that when he arrives at the destination to give it to the receiver of the information, the receiver goes, got it, and he can run it to someone else. It's clear. Now, folks, this was given way before UPS, way before FedEx, way before the United States Postal System, way before Pony Express, 1700s, way back there. Make it clear. Make the vision so clear that everybody gets it. How many remember in elementary school when your teacher gave you uh, an exercise and she or he said, now I want you to sit in a circle or stand in a circle, 15 people, and I'm going to write a message on a piece of paper and I'm going to hand it to this young lady. She's going to read the message. She's going to put it in her pocket 
and she's going to whisper the message to the person next to her. She's going to get it. She's going to whisper it to the person all the way around 15 people. And at the end, the last person, the 15th person, then will report what was on the piece of paper. And here's what will be on the piece of paper. She didn't tell the people, but she wrote it down. And what she wrote down was, when you're finished with this exercise, go to the chalkboard and write, I love you. The little girl read it, put it in her pocket, and started the message secretly around the circle. And the number 15 young man stood up, number 15, sure of the message. Remember, when you're finished with this exercise, go to the chalkboard and write, I love you. And here's what he said. When you eat gummy bears, make sure they don't taste like a chalkboard. <laughs> you're laughing because you've all been through that exercise before. And some of the things your person came up with was wackier than that. So, you know what that's called? That's called lost in translation. Sometimes... We feel like we are making sense and we're not making sense at all. God says, you want a vision? Come along alone with me. If you're straining to see the future, you're straining to see the direction, the goal I have, strain for it. Don't quit straining for it. And if in your straining, you'll come alone with me. I will speak to you. And when I speak to you, write it down for a permanent record. And after you've written it down for a permanent record, go back and then make sure that it's so clear that anyone can run it across country and reproduce it to the next hearer. Today, I challenge you. This church, when Robin and I came 20 years ago, in two weeks, I'll preach the message I preached 20 years ago, my first Sunday. I still have that message. And that day I said, our mission will be to win the lost, help the poor, and teach the abundant life. Win the lost, help the poor, teach abundant life. Later, we made it even more simple. Outreach, compassion, and abundance. And those are easy things to remember. Some of you have forgotten because it's not important to you. But for those of you that it's important to, you can spit that out so quick because it's, you don't lose that in translation. Win the lost, help the poor, teach abundant living. I believe that we've stayed on course. I really believe that. And by the way, on August 31st, a Friday night, our 20th anniversary, I will give you the next part of the vision. And I don't want you to miss it. I want you to bow your head with me. I wonder today, I've gone too long, but I wonder today how many in the room would say, Pastor, I've lost vision I haven't even been straining for it. I, I'm just kind of, I, I go to work, I, I go to school. I don't even know why I'm doing it. Oh, I know I got to eat. I know I got to feed my kids, but I'm so miserable. I, I, I can't, I, I don't have vision. Pastor, I, I need vision. I, I've lost my way with God. I've gotten depressed over it and I, I've lost my way with God. Today, I heard the truth. I heard about vision. And I'm ready for a new vision in Jesus' name. Pastor, I really need God's forgiveness in my life. I need a do-over. I need to start new. And I don't care today, church, how old you are, how young you are. This can happen to anybody. But it's never too late to begin again with the Lord. And today, if you want me to include you in my final prayer, 
you need God's forgiveness today with your head bowed and your eyes closed pastor I need you to include me in that final prayer if that's you I want you to raise your hands right now, quickly, all over this room, as high as you possibly can so I can see it. Yes, 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 yes. How many more in the center? I, I've just called off the center. Yeah, I see your hand. I see your hand here. I see your hand right there. I see yours in the back. I see yours. You can put it down. How about my left? You're right over here. Raise it real high. Over here. Yes, 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 yes. Huh? Anybody else on this left side, your right side? You'd raise it up. I see your hand, sir. You can put it down. In the back, you can put it down. Uh, hallelujah. How about my right, your, le your left, over here, way over here on this side. Raise it up as high as you can. If you need God's vision in your life, you need forgiveness. I see yours, 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 yours there. How about the bleacher section? Raise it high in the bleacher. Praise God. Pray. How about the overflow over here in the overflow section? Hands going up. Every God bless your hearts. I love you. Stand to your feet. Everyone standing uh, this afternoon. And we're going to sing this chorus. We sang it earlier. The earth will shake. And on the first words of this song, this song, if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to take a second step with me. I want you on the first word of this song, the. If you raise your hand, I want you to step from where you are to the aisle nearest you and come and join me. I want to pray with you before we go home. You come as we sing it right now. Come on, the earth. The earth. For his name will pray as heaven and earth sing. Holy is the name, holy is the name of Jesus, Jesus. The earth will will shake and tremble before him. We'll break as heaven and mercy. Holy is the name, holy is the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I see the King has come, light of the world, reaching out for us. Wow, 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 wow. Somebody shout to God today. Hallelujah. Could I have some workers, some helpers here at the altar just step forward and maybe touch someone on their shoulder, let them know you love them today. And we're going to pray. I want everybody in the room to reach both hands in the direction of this altar right now. Would you do it right now? Let's pray. Father, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, I thank you today for those who have stepped forward to say, I need God's forgiveness. I need a new vision. I need to strain for vision. God, I'm ready to see the vision. Lord, today I pray that you'd bring forgiveness and deliverance to every heart at this altar altar right now. Devil, take your hands off of these precious men and women. In Jesus name, I pray for victory from heaven. I want everybody at this altar and everybody in this room and everybody in this stage, I want you to pray it out loud with me as loud as you can. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I've, sinned. I've sinned. I'm not proud of I'm it. Not proud of it. But I admit it. But I admit today, it. Today, today, I lay my sin down. My sin take down. it, I pray. It, I, pray. I, don't I don't want it anymore. I reach to heaven I reach to, to receive Receive your forgiveness receive your to forgiveness. take the place of my sin. Of my I, ask I ask that you would accept me, Lord, you accept into, me, Lord. into your wonderful family. Your wonderful today, family. Today, today, Jesus, today, Jesus, I give, I give my life completely to you. Completely to you. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Thank, you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church. Put your hands together today. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that today. By the way, I've got an offer here if you want it. Uh, I've got a cell phone. I've had it for 20 years. 305-970-6300. If something touched your heart today and you need a word or an answer or a prayer, just text me right now and I'll get back to you. Don't call, just text. I run my text, I run my phone. I've had it for 20 years and I'm not running anywhere. I'd be happy to pray with you today. Hey, I love you so much. Thanks for watching. God bless.